Hello everybody, welcome back to Read and Reread. I am Angelia and today it is time for Friday Reads on April 19th. This is going to be kind of a, I don't know if it'll be double length, I hope not, but it'll, it's a double wide Friday Reads because I didn't make one last week. I was at out of town at the San Antonio Book Festival. In fact, I'm wearing my festival t-shirt today. Behold, my t-shirt. And so I want to talk a little bit about the festival and the books I've been reading these past two weeks. If you watched my uh, Wednesday video, which was the This or That People April tag, I talked a little bit about the my reversal of fortune during my weekend in San Antonio and how I became ill with some sort of a bizarre vertigo thing. And I have residual dizziness and lightheadedness and stuff still going on from that. So, but I don't want to talk about that all over again. It's just, it's, it's just kind of hovering. It's, it's gradually improving, but let's talk about the good stuff, the festival and my reading. So before we get into that, a quick uh, recap of recent television viewing. Um, we're still watching Schitt's Creek and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Eventually we will get to the end of these series. And then the best thing we watched over the past couple weeks was Ripley, the new adaptation of Patricia Highsmith's novel, The Talented Mr. Ripley on Netflix. And uh, I loved the old uh, Ripley movie from the late 90s, but this new adaptation is just beautiful. It's in black and white. It's over, I can't remember how many episodes, eight or 10 episodes. It, the pacing is not fast. Some people, um, I think people who don't like this, they either find it too slow paced or they didn't like the fact that it's filmed in black and white. We loved both of those things. We loved the time that the filmmaker took with this adaptation. It is absolutely stunning. Um, and, and Andrew Scott as Tom Ripley is stellar. He is just unnerving and fascinating and creepy. And the, just the whole thing was absolutely fantastic. I loved it. I have never read the book. In fact, I've never read any of Patricia Highsmith's books. If you have a recommendation for uh, a book by Highsmith that I should read, let me know down below. So let's talk about this book festival. It was really fun. It was downtown San Antonio. The hotel we were staying at was uh, catty corner directly across from the Alamo. And so <laughs> that was kind of funny because every time we came out, there was, you know, the tourists swarming around at the Alamo and it was walking distance down to the festival. It was on the grounds of the San Antonio Public Library and also part of the University of Texas San Antonio campus, their art school was down there too. It was kind of an indoor outdoor thing. It was a beautiful sunny day. It was in the mid eighties, which was, we, it was fabulous, but we overheard a man saying, oh, it's so hot. And we were just laughing because that is, that's not hot. He must be from out of town because, sorry, that's not hot. Um, so anyway, it was very nice. So some of the uh, author sessions that I attended, or we attended, actually it was three of us because Stephen and I were there and then my daughter Emma was able to come for the day from San Marcos. So it was really fun. Our favorite session was Justin Torres, author of Blackouts. And going into this, I was very interested. I keep hearing about Blackouts. It won the National Book Award for Fiction last year. And I've been intrigued by it for a while, but I just couldn't get a good grasp. I knew it was kind of experimental. I couldn't really get a good sense of what it was actually about or what, what was going on with this book. But I, the session was so great. He was uh, charming. He was funny. He was really interesting. And he talked about the things that inspired him to write this novel, the kind of the background information about this researcher named Jan Gay, look her up on Wikipedia and her career and the work that she did that got kind of obliterated. She got sort of erased from a seminal work that she did about, well, it was supposed to be about homosexuality and they study these cohorts of people, but it got kind of hijacked and turned into a treatise on, on deviance. 
he got inspired to write this this fiction and I still can't explain to you what his book's about but I'm very interested to read it and and then they ran out of copies at the the book tent the bookseller a local bookstore called Nowhere Books was the uh, sponsoring bookseller of the event and they ran out but I do have a copy now I have a, a book haul video is is imminent but I did buy Creep by Marion Gerba and we went to her session as well and she was paired with Roger Reeves the poet and that was another session and then we also attended a session that was in a beautiful chapel and I'm having a brain fog but that author was R. Eric and his last name has left my building but I'll put it up on the screen and he was interviewed by the owner of the bookstore and they had a funny conversation there was another session I was going to go to late in the day but we kind of flamed out and also there was an unprecedented stroke of good fortune that happened during the festival uh, we came out of the library out of one of these sessions and this lady walked up with a flyer and she was from the Friends of the Public Library and she informed us that in the basement of the San Antonio Public Library there is a used bookstore it's called the book cellar cellar like like a basement cellar and they were having a half price sale on Saturday oh the joy so there is no basement at the Alamo but there is a basement in the library at in San Antonio and we we had to hit it twice because the first time we got down there we had a session starting in about 20 minutes so we had to come back and so yes and the, and the prices oh my gosh the, the fiction the novels were like a dollar a piece and then there was a few specialty items that were that were more and this is one of the best used bookstores I've ever seen it was all organized library style they had library shelving it was Dewey organized oh I'm so excited for Emma because she's moving to San Antonio this summer to start grad school so she can join this library and hit this this bookstore whenever she wants so anyway that was terrific fun unexpected fun and so we we saw sessions we visited vendors we bought stuff a great time was had by all and then I woke up and got violently ill the next morning so you just you never know what's gonna happen next okay let's talk about this week in reading the last time I checked in I think I was still reading Down City by Leah Carroll this was a book that I selected to read for people April it is a memoir the subtitle is a daughter's story of love memory and murder I talked about it a little bit the other day in my people April tag video but this was a really good memoir Leah Carroll uh, wanted to reflect upon and learn more about her parents who both died when she was young her mother died when she was four in a mysterious incident she was told for years as a child that it was a car accident but actually it happened in a hotel where her mother had gone to purchase drugs and there was a bizarre link to the to the Rhode Island Mafia that she didn't discover for years but she began to dig and find out the truth about what happened to her mother and how her mother was used as a disposable pawn basically in the ensuing uh, police investigation and the prosecution of some of these mafia members she also writes even more extensively about her father who she had in her life until he died when she was 18 and he suffered from mental illness and alcoholism but uh, she loved and idolized her father and he loved her as well he was just a very troubled person I want to read just a couple of snippets from this book that give you a sense about the style of the book and the the just the the love and care that emanates from this book about her father as she struggles as an adult to understand him and what happened in his life she says it is almost as hard to explain him as it is to explain my mom whom I never really knew I feel like I'll never get it right how you couldn't trust him not for a minute but you always did how when he turned his attention to you it was like everything was lit up and when he decided he was done everything went ice cold the way that he presented himself as invincible smarter faster funnier 
so that when he was vulnerable, it was somehow extra pitiful. The way he scrunched up his chin and poked it with his index finger when he was thinking and he didn't realize anyone was looking. The ways he let me down and I let him down and how I still think about him 20 years later, almost every day. Oh, it's so heartbreaking. Um, there, there's a part in this book when they go on a trip together to Washington, D.C. that just, it's just devastating. Um, I also like this, this passage. This is a, a lighter passage. It's about the summer after, I think she's fifth or sixth grade. She's living with her dad. Um, he's a self-educated man. He's really brilliant and talented, but he just never could keep it together for any any long string of time with his various um, struggles that he had. Um, but I like this. This is the description of the summer. and I can relate to this. Not not with the dad problem here, but uh, her, her summer reading adventures. Dad always had a stack of books next to him. And he balances a glass of ice cubes and water on top. He moves among Tom Clancy thrillers, books on photography, and biographies of ex-presidents. That summer, I read Clan of the Cave Bear and worked my way through most of the V.C. Andrews books, all checked out from our local library. I love the dirty sections, and I'm proud that I'm allowed to read whatever I want. I think the prose is dark and gothic and wonderful, and I spend many nights in my sweltering bedroom writing my own stories of intrigue and death. The main character is usually what I imagine myself to be in 10 years. I describe her as no nonsense with raven colored hair. And that one, I just had to laugh because I went through that whole thing with those cave bear books and the flowers in the attic books. And I even remember being a kid and being very, very intrigued by descriptions of raven colored hair. I thought, oh, just to have that smooth black hair. I had a fantasy of having smooth black hair and dark blue eyes. <laughs> it never happened, but you know, a girl can dream. Oh, this, this was a terrific memoir. And then the other thing I was reading at that time was Further Tales of the City by Armistead Maupin. This was book three of the Tales of the City series. And I have, I'm hard put to explain my ongoing interest in this because are these good books? Not exactly. They're just kind of they're just kind of addictive. They're kind of they're kind of junky and fun, but then all of a sudden he'll slip in something very emotional. It's you I think you have to be a certain age to appreciate these because the settings begin in the late 70s and now we're up in the beginning of the 80s. It takes place in San Francisco, which is a setting I'm familiar with. And, but the plots are so ridiculous. If you watched soap operas in that time period, as the world turns and young and the restless, you just remember how preposterous the plots were. And those that's the kind of plots that are in this. It's like the young and the restless, but if half of the people were gay. And but but I just love Michael and Marianne and now even Brian. He's grown on me and Mrs. Madrigal. And so for some reason, even though they are completely ridiculous, I'm still reading this series. The next one I read was Upright Women Wanted by Sarah Gailey. This was a book that I selected for Trans Girl April. Sarah Gailey is a non-binary author. This book is a lot of fun, but there's also a serious underside. It's very slim. It's very fast. It's an adventure story. It is basically, it is, let me see what all, what all I would have to include in this description. It is a queer dystopian western um coming of age coming out adventure story i think i've hit the main points here there's a young woman named esther who is escaping an arranged marriage to somebody terrible it's in the future but it's that something has happened everything's kind of non-technological and covered wagons and things and there's an authoritative regime. Uh, women are highly controlled. Everything's very right wing. And Esther, um, her best friend whom she was in love with has been executed for a crime of having uh, like illegal information materials. And she's supposed to marry her friend's, uh, I think it was husband or fiance. She, she's being kind of offered up uh, to, to smooth over the, this uh, scandal that has happened. And she wants no part of it and she escapes 
in the librarian wagon. There's a lot librarians that travel from town to town distributing authorized materials and she thinks she can run away and maybe join their ranks. And <clears throat> so that all happens like in the first two pages. So it's not a big spoiler. Well, Esther, of course, finds out that they are not exactly uh, what she thought they were. And in the best tradition of adventure and dystopian books, she finds out a lot more about the truth of what's going on than she ever knew and that she has depths of courage and, and heart within her. And she comes to terms with other aspects of her identity with the help of the librarians. And then there's violence and danger and action and there's a lot going on in a very slim book. It's nonstop, it's very fast, it's very fun. And I would recommend it now or anytime. It'd be a great selection for your pride reading in June. It was just, I really had fun reading this book. After that, I went into my uh, reread of Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout. I have been rereading this series and this is the last of the Lucy books, although there is a new one coming out later this year. And so after having read the quartet, I still maintain that my favorite one is the third one, O oh William, but I really loved this reread of all four books closer together. I feel like I really got a more full sense of Lucy Barton, the character. She's a writer in, and at the time of this book, she is in her 60s. Her ex-husband, William, is I think he's something like 71. She's a little bit younger than him. This is a pandemic novel. At the beginning of this book, it is the spring of 2020. Lucy is supposed to be on a book tour. She is an author. She's already canceled some events to go overseas because she just had a funny feeling that she didn't want to go. And Lucy is prone to uh, premonitions and kind of weird intuitions sometimes. And so she just wasn't feeling it. So she wasn't really doing anything at that moment and her ex-husband William who they were married for about 20 years raised two daughters then they divorced they've been divorced about 20 years Lucy's had another husband since then who passed away and William's had a couple of wives and and one more child anyway he contacts her and he said he is a he's a scientist he is a what is he a parasitologist and he says Lucy something bad is coming down the pike and we need to get out of town we need to tell the girls to get out of town and she just thinks he's overreacting she's seen some news stories about this virus but she's like oh, yeah whatever and he's like no we're we're leaving and we're leaving tomorrow and she's like okay whatever so so they leave and they go and they live in this rented house kind of an airbnb kind of deal up on the coast of maine so this is the story of the year that Lucy and William spend together in this house out of the city. But really, it's about the ongoing saga of Lucy trying to understand herself, understand who she is, her, her very difficult background that she is from, from an impoverished and abusive home, and understanding William, the person that she knows probably the most, except for her children, and who knows her the most, but they still frequently are completely baffled by one another. And it's, it's hard to explain why that is a, makes a good story, but it really does. One thing that struck me, this one sentence early on, this is when William is trying to hustle everyone out of town and Lucy just doesn't get it, but she's telling this from you know, maybe you know later. And she says, it's odd how the mind does not take in anything until it can. And that really is a theme, not just about 2020, but about this entire series, about Lucy spending her whole life waiting for her mind to take things in and then re-examining them throughout her life. Um, something else I love about this book is how accurately Strout captures the, the tenor of spring and summer and fall and winter of 2020 and how it it threw everybody off and it, it, there's just this uneasiness but in different ways so for example William brings a bunch of books to this house they're staying at and then the book itself has has rooms with 
bookshelves and books and he's just kind of reading up a storm and working his way through all the books and Lucy just cannot fathom it like she can't focus she can't read even though she is a reader she's just kind of stuck she can't focus or keep her thoughts on anything and I thought th there it is that's that's like the divide of people in that time of 2020 you were either reading incessantly or you couldn't read at all I was an incessant reader it was basically I'm in a book I'm just in a book and then every now and then I look up and see what's going on I hear the news <laughs> retreat back into the book but I thought that that was that was us that was all of us we were one of those things or the other or maybe both as time went on and if you have still not read the Lucy Barton books go back and begin with the first one and read your way through and see which one you like the best now my parting thought on this and this is for people who have read these is I I don't really like William very much he did not fare well in this reread event um, it was he was kind of on shaky grounds to begin with and, and having read him again he just bugs me he I don't like the way he's dismissive of her and how he will listen to her or be empathetic to Lucy when he's in the right mood or on his own terms or when she completely hits the skids but on a day-to-day -day basis it's like she has to time when she's gonna talk to him about certain things and I just don't like that at all so he, he irritates me and I think he's supposed to actually I think I don't think Strout did that by accident so if you've read these books let me know what you think about William because he I find it fascinating and super aggravating all right so then we were up to a point where uh, I would come home from the trip and I was feeling very unwell and that's when I decided to read attack of the black rectangles by a s king this is a middle grade book it's based on an incident that actually happened with King's son I guess it was her, it's a child I'm not sure if it was a son it's a son in the book there's a sixth grader named Mac and in his class at school they are going to read The Devil's Arithmetic by Jane Yolen which is a time travel book about the Holocaust and I'm actually going to be reading this book in the upcoming week in a buddy read with Michael Clark but I wanted to read this book as a companion piece and what happens is this trio of friends that are in this sixth grade class discover that their copies of the book have redacted uh, portions in them. So rather than being about book banning, it's about book censoring and the concept of, of covering up certain things because somebody, a teacher or administrator or somebody thinks that certain kids in the class can't handle certain material. So I don't want to spoil for you what what they find out has been redacted and why and how they react to it but it's really a great story about young people finding uh, their voice and learning how to question and protest things how adults can be very uh, they can be supportive they can be confusing they can be misleading they can be patronizing they have all kinds of different experiences with the adults they encounter positive and negative and there's a side plot about Mac and some family problems with his father who is unstable that's also very touching and, and and then also to make the kids realistic and not just cardboard figures staging a protest they are they're full of uh, doubts and confusions and emotional stuff and crushes and they have meltdowns and so it's very sixth grade realistic and my favorite thing in this friendship group is the the girl Marcy schooling the two boys that are the rest of the friendship group on what feminism means and why it pertains to them and affects them and why they should care and it, that part is just a joy Marcy's a great character uh, so I enjoyed this very much and I'm looking forward to reading the devil's arithmetic in this in this upcoming week then I read Western Lane by Chetna Maru and I've been meaning to read this book for a long time it was uh, I think it made it to the shortlist of the Booker Prize last year and that's when it caught my attention and I had it on my list to read never did it and then I ended up buying a copy back when I had um, a gift card at Christmas still didn't read it then it turned up on the women's prize list um, and still hadn't read it so finally I read it 
And this was just a beautiful short novel. I don't know if you call it a novella. I think it's just a short novel, but it's under 200 pages. So if anytime you want a shorter book, if you want to read it because it's on a prize list or you want to read it in Shorty September or whenever you feel like it, it really is a beautiful little book. I think it got unfairly compared last year to Foster by Claire Keegan. I think it's just circumstance that two books that are short and told by a narrator that's about 11 um, and have to do with some themes of grief included in the story. I mean, that that is true, but there's no real reason to compare the two books. They're very different uh, styles, plots, characters, experiences. They really only have in common that they're short and told by a girl and somebody's experiencing grief in the plot. Everything else is quite different. There is uh, a trio of sisters. They are 11, 13, and 15 at the beginning of the story. They are uh, British Indian kids and their father and their mother has recently died. We don't know why she died. That's They don't get into that, but they are all dealing with the immediate aftermath of trying to navigate their everyday lives in the wake of the loss of their mother. And the, the father, um, he immerses his daughters into the game of squash, and which he played as a young man, and as a way to kind of focus them and organize them and give them something to do and help himself with imposing a structure. And a sister-in-law of his tells him, you know, your girls are going to be wild. You need to do something with them. And, but so he, he's trying to, to channel the situation. And so he has them playing squash and training hard. And the youngest one, Gopi, who narrates the story, turns out to be quite talented. And she, she's really into it. So during the course of the book, we, we do get a lot of squash. And I thought about, during these parts of the book, I thought about the Queen's Gambit and how I don't know anything about chess and I'm not really interested in chess. But that did not deter me from really enjoying that show. Didn't read the book. But so all the stuff about squash, the history of squash, the famous players of squash, the feeling of when you're playing squash, that, that was not a deterrent at all. And in fact, it, it, it did enhance this, this sense of uh, the girl just, Gopi, just immersing herself and trying to channel all of her energies and her emotions and her... 11 year old uh, puberty mental mess into something uh, controllable. And we, we just get a lot of wonderful moments between the sisters, between the father and the children and, and their inability to communicate directly about how they're feeling, but just the sense of the grief and the anguish that just kind of washes through in tides. And then this poor man with three teenage daughters trying to, trying to get through and he's just kind of falling apart. And the, the whole thing was just, it's very understated, it's very controlled, but it's all simmering there beneath the surface. Oh, and one other thing about it that nobody mentioned, well, maybe they did, but I missed it, but it's set in the 80s. And it, they never say the year was 1984, whatever, but at the very beginning, they're watching, they're remembering when they used to watch John McEnroe on TV. And his years of being uh, active in tennis were late 70s to mid 80s. And then a couple other times, it's very, very subtle. There's some sort of little reference that places it in the early to mid 80s. But it, you gotta, you gotta watch for it closely, but it's in there. Okay, so that brings me up to what I am reading right now. I'm reading these short stories, Dearborn, by Ghassan Zanadine. But these are stories about uh, Arab, American, Arab American community in Dearborn, Michigan, mostly Lebanese. And uh, at, I've read, I've only read two of the stories so far, but they are, they are funny. The first story has to do with a would-be actor who has a job as a census taker in the neighborhood and he's just walking around gaining weight because he knows everyone in the neighborhood and it's customary to offer the visitor a snack and it's rude to refuse it. So he's just eating his way from house to house and then he gets involved in a plot with a 
a guy who's trying to go to Hollywood. Anyway, I don't want to give it away, but um, and the second book was really funny. Uh, two, there's, it's narrated by two collective groups, a group of husbands and a group of wives. And the occasion is somebody has appeared, a stranger has appeared at the community center. He comes in and he's wearing this shocking pink robe and he takes it off and he has a teeny tiny Speedo with images of Lebanon printed on it. And the responses of the men versus the responses of the women and their attempts to solve the mystery of who this dude is who keeps showing up in these different really small speedos. <laughs> and um, the women give him a nickname based on this scandalous outfit that leaves nothing to the imagination. And they call him the Beast from the Middle East. And the men are kind of jealous because he's he's very in shape and they go to this community center nobody really works out they just sit around in the jacuzzi and speculate on who this guy is but nobody has the nerve to go up and talk to him so that's as far as i've gotten i've read those two stories i'm enjoying them very much and i am still reading poetry unbound which has well more than a poem a day really because there's 50 poems but poems and and explorations and essays about each poem and I'm still enjoying this a lot as well all right Woo, that is that enough I think that's a lot and more to come I'm looking forward to the books I have planned for this week what have you read this week what did you love what did you not love what is on your horizon that you're excited about let me know and tell me what you think about any of these books that I have been reading and I hope to be back soon. I have one more tag that is April related that I really want to get done. And I have a book haul. I wasn't going to yet, but then, you know, I didn't know there was going to be a library sale. It's not my fault. So now there's things have reached haul level. So I will be back soon with those things in the week to come. And I hope you have a great weekend. Bye-bye.